Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me as the speaker today in the Congress. It's a big privilege for me to be here and to give lecture for all of you. And during the next 20 minutes, I would love to share some details, some information, guidelines, recommendations about uh, quality assurance in lump medicine and pre analytical errors and their prevention. So first of all, actually, before I got started working on this presentation for this Congress, I tried to find the definition of quality assurance. And there are a lot of definitions uh, which you can find online, and one of them, quality assurance and systematic measurement, comparison with the standard, monitoring for process for errors prevention. Exactly what we do on a daily basis being in medical laboratory. So for instance, when we collect blood for any lab test, we try to get specimen appropriate with good quality, first time without recollection and retests. Because majority of lab tests, um, majority of clinical decisions are based on uh, lab test results. And if you are looking at total testing process, you'll be able to see how many people are involved in this process. So we can see that there are like patient self, relatives sometimes, phlebotomist or nurses who is collecting blood for lab tests, also clinicians uh, who is taking first and second clinical decision. And last but not least, also lab technician who is processing blood specimen. And we all can imagine how many little tiny mistakes all those people might make, which can affect accuracy of blood test result and patient safety. That's why uh, when we talk about pre-analytical stage, when we look at pre-analytical stage, we always try to prevent uh, pre-analytical errors which might affect quality of blood specimens, which might affect accuracy of blood test results and patient safety in general. So I think we, you, uh, we, we all know the statistics uh, that uh, m most of lab errors come from pre-analytical stage up to 75%. And actually, there are a lot of potential causes uh, of pre-analytical errors. So we always can, we can talk about patient identification. We can talk about misidentification mis errors. Uh, we always uh, recommend our patients to get ready for lab tests. Uh, also, right device and right way for specimen collection. Uh, using of non-expired products for blood collection, uh, appropriate order of draw, tourniquet applying, uh, drawing not from difficult veins for, uh, to get uh, blood for lab tests, and many, many other factors might affect accuracy of blood test results. So let's talk about all those factors one by one, and let's see how those errors might affect uh, quality of patient treatment and quality of blood test results. So first of all, when we treat patient in a phlebotomy room uh, to collect blood, we always ask if patient is well prepared for lab tests. Uh, and what we always recommend to our patients for how to get ready for lab tests. First of all, fasting at least 12 hours for, before specimen collection. Uh, to avoid smoking, to avoid drinks, and definitely to inform a blood collection staff, nurse or phlebotomist, uh, if patient takes any medicine. So it's very simple rules. Also avoid any strong physical activities 24 hours before blood collection. Otherwise, uh, quality of blood test might be affected. Second thing, we, always, uh, we know that uh, we collect blood for different kind of tests hematology, chemistry, coagulation, blood culture, etc. And for different lab tests, we need to, collect, we need to get blood and to mix it with, with a specific uh, reagent, anticoagulant. That's why we use different vacutainers, blood collection tubes and blood vials for blood culture with different anticoagulants, like what might be sodium citrate for which we use for coagulation, heparin for um, uh, chemistry, uh, EDTA for, blood, for hematology, etc. That's why each container which we use to collect venous blood from our patient needs to be treated as a lab reagent. And also we do recommend to check expiring dates and uh, keep non-used 
containers uh, in room temperature to avoid exposure of high temperature and low temperature. And also, we all don't eat yogurts, expired yogurts for breakfast. That's why we don't use expired tubes also, as an example, uh, for specimen collection. Second difficult choice. Uh, we all know that uh, for chemistry, immunochemistry, uh, in most of the cases we use serum, uh, serum uh, to run specimen for most of chemistry tests. S and uh, like few, uh, many years ago, like 20, 30 years ago, gel technology was introduced to the market to extend stability of chemistry analytes. So now, we, in majority of medical labs, we use uh, serum gel tubes for chemistry and immunochemistry. Same time, there are many pre-analytical factors which might affect accuracy of chemistry and immunochemistry lab test results. So, for instance, when we deal with serum tubes, we always know that sometimes we can expect uh, fibrin stands, fibrin mass in serum following the disintegration process. That's, and unfortunately, as you can see from this slide, there are lots of publications which you can find online showing that uh, fibrin is a very dangerous substance. It can lead to false negative, false, false positive results for many categories of tests, especially sensitive ones, like troponin, HIV testing might be affected by fibrin presence. That's why maybe serum is not the best type of specimen which might be used for chemistry tests. Second thing, gel. Gel is very good uh, material which separates serum from clot uh, in an evacuated tube. But same time, when we keep tube in a high temperature, when we don't respect uh, recommended temperature and speed of centrifugation, we can expect tiny gel globules and serum after centrifugation, which you can see on this picture. And unfortunately, those globules are very dangerous because they might be uh, aspirated by probe of the instrument and they might affect probe itself. And last but not least, uh, they might affect accuracy of blood test results. That's why gel, fibrin, it's a factor which might affect uh, accuracy of many categories of tests, many lab test results, including troponin and HIV. That's why uh, during last few years, last maybe I can tell five, seven years, um, modern lab medicine is moving from serum to plasma, using of plasma for chemistry and immunochemistry tests. Uh, because if, first of all, with plasma, we don't expect any fibrin issues. Plasma is free of fibrin. And with plasma, we don't Ex, uh, we, we, we can decrease turnaround time because we don't, ha don't have to wait for blood clots in time. That's why it's like best choice uh, to use for chemistry tests to improve your own time and to imp improve specimen quality. Especially nowadays, there are like modern technology exists on the market which we call Baricore, which is tube with non-gel mechanical separator. So this, this is just rubber, piece of rubber in the tube, which separates uh, plasma from blood cells during centrifugation process and keeps most of the analytes stable for much longer uh, comparing serum tubes because of new technology of separation. That's why combination of plasma and mechanical separate, uh, separation uh, improves stability of many analytes in decreased turn time and definitely helps to consolidate many categories of tests into one tube only, which improve patient safety and patient satisfaction. So, as you can see, there are a lot of studies showing that, for instance, uh, this technology, uh, heparin technology with mechanical separator, uh, decreased number of tubes impacted by fibrin and definitely decreased costs related to remediation activities. Also, uh, I would love to say that uh, it's because it's completely different separation technology. It gives us, at the end of the irrigation process, completely different quality of plasma with less cellular presence. So less presence of white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. That's why such kind of plasma might be, not, not might be, it's uh, compatible with even sensitive, sensitive category of tests. So I would say that even glucose is stable in such tubes for 18 hours in room temperature because of less, less cellular presence. That's why 
uh, in majority of cases, like uh, we can say that um, modern labs, most of the labs, they use like non-gel tubes for most of the chemistry tests, uh, like serum gel tubes. Serum non-gel tubes might be used for therapeutic drug monitoring, glucose tube for glucose testing, and sometimes heparin tube. We can say like three, four tubes might be used in uh, chemistry lab. Uh, if we move to heparin technology with mechanical separation, separator, it might be only one tube. So in this case, we'll be able to collect one tube and see the four tubes, which is much uh, cost effect effective um, hospital-wise, and definitely it might improve patient satisfaction a lot. Also, as I have already mentioned, that um, um, Baricore is compatible with um, therapeutic drug monitoring. Unfortunately, it's not recommended to use serum gel tubes uh, for, uh, for, for drug testing because gel might absorb um, most of the drugs. They can see that like, like most of, uh, more than 40 drugs might be affected by using of uh, gel technology out of one, uh, 167 drugs uh, might be tested. With this technology, we can say that uh, most of the drugs uh, are not being affected by this technology because it's non-gel technology. It's pretty compatible with therapeutic drug monitoring testing. Also, another uh, point uh, which I have already mentioned, mentioned that uh, this technology is pre pre pretty compatible with most of the tests and can decrease your around time significantly. Like, uh, how do we centrifuge, uh, how long do we centrifuge serum gel tubes? Like, for 10 minutes. Uh, but recall might be centrifuge for three minutes only. So we can save seven minutes from centrifugation time and half an hour from blood clotting time because we don't have to wait for blood clotting time because it's plasma tube. So the, in this case, we'll be able to release blasted results at least 37 minutes earlier if we uh, comparing usage of serum gel tubes, which is really crucial sometimes for ER, for emergency. Uh, next point, which uh, is really crucial when we talk about pre-analytical stage, uh, order of draw. Uh, so we all know that order of draw is really important to avoid cross-contamination. Uh, between tubes being collected from one patient. So we all know that like uh, blood culture should be first, co coagulation second, chemistry, and uh, hematology at the end, and gluco glucose tube at the end. If we change this order of draw by mistake, if we don't remember correct order of draw, unfortunately, blood test results might be affected, and second clinical decision might be not right, might be not correct. So I would love to give you a couple of examples. So for instance, if we collect coagulation tube after chemistry, after serum gel tube, in this case, uh, some, uh, minor particle of clot activator might go to second tube collected, which is coagulation. In this case, coagulation cascade might be affected. And unfortunately, it might it definitely affect accuracy of coagulation blood test results. Another example, if we collect hematology tube before chemistry. So what is anticoagulant we have in hematology tube? EDTA. It's two or three ions of potassium. And we measure potassium in chemistry tubes. That's why definitely if we collect EDTA tube, hematology tube before chemistry tube, level of potassium would be false elevated, unfortunately. So it would affect accuracy of blood test results. That's why order of draw is really important, and we always keep telling to end users, nurses, phlebotomists, to respect this order of draw. Also, we all know that sometimes it's difficult to collect blood from patients with difficult vein access, for agile veins, from kids, from elderly patients. And definitely right vein, uh, choosing of right vein gives us better chance to get better quality of blood specimen for lab tests. Also, we all know that we have to disinfect skin before collecting blood, and alcohol should be dried by air. If it do, it's not dried, unfortunately, it would give extra pain to our patients, and last but not least, it would create extra risk of hemolysis and rejection, unfortunately, and, rec and following recollection. Tourniquet, also we collect blood uh, and we have to use tourniquet. 
And unfortunately, sometimes we see that nurses, phlebotomists, they keep tourniquets for all the time of blood collection, like for one minute, two minutes, three minutes, which is not recommended. Uh, tourniquet should be released within 59 seconds. Actually, not within, within 59 seconds. When blood goes into one tube, we have to release tourniquet. Uh, if we keep tourniquet longer, it uh, would be cause of hemoconcentration and elevated results for many hematology parameters. Uh, hematocrit, uh, uh, CBC, etc., would be affected. That's why we always say that release tourniquet when blood goes into one tube. And also sometimes, especially non-experienced nurses, they ask patients to work with fist uh, to make veins more visible. It's good for nurse to get blood first time, but unfortunately it's not good for patient. Because if we work with the fist, with the hand, uh, it activates myocytes and release potassium. So, so it would be a reason of false elevated results of potassium and pseudotalemia. That's why we always keep saying that please keep fist tight and when blood goes in the first tube, you can release your fist. And I actually, I mentioned many times during my presentation already, hemolysis, hemolysis, hemolysis. So we all know there are so many reasons of hemolysis. So it might be, uh, uh, so the, we, uh, we, can, we can mention uh, extended tourniquet time applying, uh, clinching, uh, getting blood from fragile and thin veins, use of 25 gauge needles, not dried alcohol, vigorous shaking of blood after collecting. So all those factors would cause hemolysis and fall in rejection. And actually, actually as you can see from this list, it's so, de so easy to prevent hemolysis. Uh, just follow best practices and international guidelines how blood needs to be collected. Second potential reason of rejection is fill volume. Because uh, when we collect blood, it's always fill mark. Fill mark, fill volume indicator on each tube. How much blood we need to collect, like 5 ml, 6 ml, 3 ml. If we collect less or more, unfortunately, uh, it would affect concentration of reagent, anticoagulant in patient's blood, and accuracy of blood test results. That's why there are also a few studies available showing that if we collect, if we proceed underfilled or overfilled tubes, so it might be uh, many, many uh, lab test results, especially coagulation, hematology might be affected. That's why it's always good to remind end users, uh, blood collection staff, to collect blood until blood reaches fill volume indicator on the tube, and then to continue the process. Next point, which is also crucial, mixing. When we make our morning tea or morning coffee, we mix blood with spoon, and we make our hot drinks sweet. Unfortunately, same, same concept in the, with the tube. We collect blood, and there is already reagent in the tube. Unfortunately, we cannot put spoon and mix it. That's why we, we, we have to perform like full, in, full inversions, like from three to, uh, from three to four, uh, four coagulation, from uh, eight to 10 for hematology tubes. That's why mixing is very important to get good quality of specimen for all those category of tests. Because without mixing, uh, we can expect clots, uh, fibrin presence, and many other issues related to the tubes, uh, quality of specimen after specimen collection. Centrifugation, another important step within pre analytical stage. So we always need to check uh, what the speed is recommended? What the time of uh, what the centrifugation time is recommended for each category of tubes? Is it fixed angle or swing bucket, bucket centrifuge needs to be used for centrifugation process? So it's always good to double check all those steps to perform centrifugation process in the best way to avoid any pre-analytical issues. Another thing which is also important: use use of special stabilizers. To, in, to extend stability of many analytes. So for instance, we know that glucose is very, is very tricky analyte. It's not stable for long time in room temperature. Because when we collect blood for glucose testing, blood cells are still alive. They still consume glucose. And each hour after keeping the tube in room temperature for an hour, 
So level of glucose has been decreased 10%. 10% one hour, 20% two hours, 30% three hours. So at the end of the working day, we'll not see glucose there, unfortunately. That's why uh, we use fluoride tubes for glucose testing. So that's why different special stabilizers, reagents, might be added to evocated tubes to increase stability, to extend stability of different certain analytes. I'm just giving an example with glucose testing. Also, I believe everyone knows uh, who is sitting in this conference room that blood collected from IV lines, from catheters, uh, is not best. It's not recommended to get blood follow-up tests from many categories of tests, including blood culture, including coagulation, etc., from catheters. But unfortunately, sometimes patients have already IV line, and we have to collect blood from IV line, which is not best. That's why we have to balance uh, what we have and how we should collect blood. That's why when blood is being collected from IV lines, at least it's recommended to use alternate arm, it's recommended to, discard, to stop line for a few minutes and to discard first amount of blood to avoid um, contamination with, flu, uh, with body fluid and medication which might be introduced to patients through IV line. And then definitely usage of special devices like lure lock, lure, lure, lure device, lure lock access device to get blood directly from IV line into evocated tube without taking syringe, which is much safer. And definitely flushing IV line after specimen collection with saline. So it's very easy to perform all those steps to get better quality of specimen from IV lines, even in case it's not recommended. So as we can see that there are so, so many different pre-analytical factors which might affect quality of blood test results, which might affect patient safety, and to your own time, if we keep in our mind recollections and uh, retests. So it affects efficiency of medical laboratory, it affects to your own time, it, affects it might lead to non-scheduled maintenance of instruments in medical laboratory, and definitely can affect second clinical decision. Also, now we, everyone counts money, and that's why all those pre-analytical errors, they cost a lot, because we have to pay for retests, we have to pay for recollections, we have to pay for maintenance of instruments because of pre-analytical errors. And actually, all those factors, all those factors might be prevented by following best practices. That's why nowadays, uh, in every medical laboratory, we always try to work with respect with quality management system. We always track and monitor pre-analytical errors. Uh, we try to define and implement quality indicators and measure outcomes of this process. And definitely use or leverage of best quality of reagents and consumables for specimen collection and for processing uh, lab specimen in medical laboratories. And definitely, there are, we try to follow international guidelines, recommendations, and SOP established in, 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 in every medical laboratory. So actually, at the end of my presentation, I would love to repeat again. Uh, definition of quality insurance. It's systematic measurement, comparison with the standard, monitoring of processes for errors prevention, which we do every single day in medical laboratory. Thank you so much. Um, uh, now, my colleague will continue the workshop, and if you have any questions, I would love to take them at the end of the session. Thanks a lot.
Bonjour tout le monde, euh, je suis ravie d'être parmi vous. Euh, ma première fois ici euh, au Maroc, donc euh, ça va être euh, une, une première expérience pour moi chez vous. En fait, euh, je suis Product and Application Specialist chez BD. Euh, je vais faire suite à, à, à la communication de mon collègue. On va parler un peu des, de la, pratique, euh, la bonne pratique des bons cultures afin d'avoir de bons résultats pour euh, aider nos, les cliniciens pour avoir le bon traitement, guider le clinicien pour le bon traitement. Donc, comme on sait que le, le, la, le sepsis fait que euh, l'OMS dit, euh, dit que le sepsis fait 11 millions de morts, de décès par, par an. Du coup, on est obligé, pardon, donc on est obligé de, 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 de gagner du temps afin de, de donner le bon traitement et de réduire le nombre de décès chez les, les patients qui ont dans un état sceptique. Pour cela, pardon, pour cela, on est obligé de, on est obligé d'avoir euh, les bons résultats au bon moment. Donc, euh, afin d'avoir ces bons résultats, on doit, on doit faire une hémoculture de la bonne manière. Comment elle doit être faite et pourquoi elle doit être faite de bonne manière Parce qu'en fait, si on pratique d'une manière euh, mauvaise manière notre hémoculture, on risque d'avoir des faux positifs, des faux négatifs et des taux de contamination. Ces trois euh, causes-là peuvent induire le clinicien en erreur. Elle, ça peut nous donner de faux, euh, euh, ça peut orienter le clinicien vers un faux euh, traitement anti-biothérapie. Du coup on est obligé de respecter les cinq, euh, les cinq pratiques, les bonnes pratiques d'hémoculture. La première, c'est de choisir le bon milieu de culture afin de, de recueillir le sang dans un milieu de culture, euh, le nombre de séries d'hémoculture et la façon de faire la prise de sang pour l'hémoculture et le volume qui est important pour l'hémoculture et aussi le moment adéquat pour l'hémoculture. Donc, par rapport à la sélection des mots cultures, euh, en fait, il est, il est préconisé de choisir les milieux de culture les plus spécifiques. Pourquoi C'est afin, on sait tous que le, le patient peut avoir euh, une clinique, euh, une infection bactérienne ou fongique, une, euh, une infection euh, euh, due au euh, tuberculose extrapulmonaire, par exemple. Euh, on a des adultes et des, euh, euh, des cas euh, enfants, donc euh, il, 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 la manière de prélever, elle est différente. Donc, pour cela, on est obligé de choisir le bon flacon pour chaque cas clinique. Pour le nombre de séries, il est préconisé de faire plusieurs euh, ensembles de flacons d'hémoculture pour chaque, pour, dans les 24 heures. Pourquoi C'est pour avoir une cohérence entre les, la, 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 le résultat qu'on aura durant la journée. Et le plus important, c'est de faire euh, une prise de sens de 20 ml sur deux flacons différents, un flacon aérobie et un autre flacon anaérobie. Les, la manière dont on prélève le sang pour l'hémoculture, euh, il est préconisé d'utiliser de de, un système ferré, fermé, de sorte d'utiliser de, un sorte d'adaptateur pour prélever un flacon, euh, pour inoculer pardon, un flacon d'hémoculture et par la suite faire le, le prélèvement sur les autres tubes pour euh, des euh, analyses supplémentaires comme la biochimie ou autres. Pour cela, on a des adaptateurs qui sont euh, adaptables et utilisation unique sur les flacons d'hémoculture sont euh, faire de, de, de c'est pour réduire les contaminations et, euh, et, plus, et réduire le, les piqûres d'aiguilles. Le, le volume de sang, il est, euh, il est très euh, important selon le type de, de patient qu'on a. 
chez les adultes, on, est, euh, on a besoin d'avoir un volume de 20 ml de sang, dont, comme on a dit euh, tout à l'heure, c'est dans deux flacons différents, hémoculture euh, anaérobie et euh, flacon hémoculture aérobie, et euh, donc 10 ml dans chaque tube. Pour les flacons pédiatrie, le volume do doit être euh, diminué. Pour le moment d'hémoculture, on est obligé de, de prélever bien sûr au bon moment pour avoir une, un bon résultat. Donc comme vous savez tous, on a des critères euh, bien précis pour faire le prélèvement. Donc en général, quand on a une pic de température, quand on a une hypothermie ou une présence de frissons des fois. Donc euh, pour cela, on peut faire un prélèvement d'un ensemble, donc flacon aérobie et anaérobie, dans la première heure. Une heure après, une deuxième série avec les deux, flac deux autres flacons. Et on est obligé d'acheminer ces flacons-là le plus rapidement possible au laboratoire. Parce qu'en fait, on est obligé de respecter le temps de croissance des germes s'ils si sont présents dans le flacon. Donc euh, le, la détection des germes, elle doit être dans la phase exponentielle de leur croissance. Donc BD, elle a des caractéristiques bien précises euh, précis, des... pour réduire tous ces risques de contamination ou des faux positifs ou faux négatifs. Donc on a un appareil, un système d'hémoculture qui nous permet de faire une incubation de nos flacons et elle nous oriente euh, par la détection de, de, notre, euh, de la présence du germe. En fait, les milieux de culture de BD sont euh, composés d'un milieu de culture très riche qui favorise la croissance rapide des micro-organismes. Pas que, on a dans chaque type de flacon, par exemple flacon aérobie et flacon pédiatrique, on a la présence de résine. Ça rend les deux, euh, flac euh, les deux flacons d'un des, des, milieu sélectif. Pourquoi la résine Elle permet d'absorber les antibiotiques. Si jamais notre patient il est sous antibiothérapie, donc là, euh, ça va inhiber l'antibiotique. Du coup, on aura une présence, une croissance des, des germes et là, on pourra avoir... Euh, un bon résultat. Donc on, ici, on a, comme vous voyez sur le graphe, on a fait une comparaison entre un flacon avec résine et un flacon sans résine. Donc comme vous voyez, euh, dans le flacon avec résine, le taux de la, croiss la concentration pardon, des antibiotiques dans le flacon avec résine a diminué, euh, la, croiss la concentration a diminué dans les premières heures après incubation. Par contre, dans un flacon sans résine, la, la concentration des, de, de l'antibiotique a persisté même après 5, 50 heures. Un autre milieu sélectif, comme l'anaérobie, contient la saponine. Cette saponine, c'est un détergent qui permet d'éclater de, de, les cellules sanguines. Donc, ça permet de libérer les euh, micro-organismes phagocytés par les globules blancs. Et du coup, euh, bon, la, la saponine, elle permet d'éclater, de liser les globules blancs et les globules rouges, et ça permet d'avoir tous les germes euh, phagocytés. Notre flacon euh, d'hémoculture, il est euh, spécifique. Ça rend la, la, la détection, elle se fait par la fluorescence. Donc, comment elle se fait par la fluorescence C'est en euh, est par la, elle est sensible par la, la, le métabolisme de micro-organismes. Donc, dès qu'on a un métabolisme, même avant la croissance, donc il y a une respiration microbienne, l'appareil peut détecter cette fluorescence. Donc, comme on a dit, l'ensemble des mots-cultures dans une prise, elle est pré préconisée par avoir un flacon des mots-cultures aérobie et un deuxième flacon anaérobie. Donc, Aérobie, présence de résine, donc ça inhibe euh, l'effet des antibiotiques. Et euh, le flacon anaérobie lytique, ça, qui contient la saponine et qui permet de libérer les germes euh, phagocytés. Et là, on va améliorer la, le résultat des mots-cultures. Donc ici, c'est quelques études qui montrent la valeur ajoutée de, des flacons anaérobie. 
En fait, en fait euh, on, a, on, a, on a trouvé que dans 13% des cultures qui étaient positives euh, uniquement dans les flacons anaérobie, ça, nous, ça leur a permis de trouver deux tiers des positifs qui étaient des anaérobies facultatives. Dans d'autres flacons qui ne contiennent pas... Euh, qui, dans d'autres cas, si on fait pas une, euh, émo, euh, un, si on n'ensemence pas pardon, des flacons anaérobies, on risque de perdre, de ne pas récupérer cette partie de micro-organismes. Une deuxième étude qui montre aussi une, euh, on va dire une euh, comparaison entre euh, la, le taux de positivité de culture dans différents flacons d'hémoculture et le temps de détection de micro-organismes. Donc, comme vous voyez ici, euh, en utilisant le bactèque lytique qui contient de la saponine, ça nous a permis d'augmenter le taux de positivité à 94%, comp comparant à d'autres flacons. Euh, par rapport au temps de détection, c'est important, comme vous le savez pour le sepsis, donc on a 18 heures de détection par rapport à d'autres flacons que ce soit flac, ancien flacon BD anaérobie, parce que l'ancien flacon anaérobie BD, il contenait que de la résine, il n'y avait pas de saponine. Du coup, ça a euh, augmenté le temps et euh, la positivité, elle, est, elle était moins sensible. Une autre étude, euh, c'est par rapport à une comparaison aussi de deux flacons, donc un flacon du Bactalert, un deuxième de BD. Donc, en faisant cette étude rétrospective, on a trouvé qu'avec le Bactalert, on a pu récupérer 16 anaérobies euh, significatives. Par contre, avec le Bactec lytique anaérobie de BD, on a pu récupérer à 89 euh, anaérobies significatives. Euh, on a fait une autre étude sur les flacons pédiatriques. Et comme vous voyez ici, donc le taux de récupération bactérienne avec les flacons euh, Bactalert, elle est de 37%. Par contre, celle de BD, elle est de 62%. Donc le temps de détection et, euh, et la neutralisation des antibiotiques, comme on a dit, puisqu'il y a la présence de euh, la résine, a permis de, que le système ou la, les flacons BD euh, donnent de bons résultats elle respecte le bon temps et la bonne pratique plus, euh, pardon, la bonne pratique, la sensibilité est supérieure et le temps qui est super réduit. Juste pour finir, désolé, j'ai fait vite parce qu'on est limité par le temps. On m'a dit qu'il faut euh, accélérer. Donc euh, cette dernière slide, c'est juste pour vous montrer les, les services de BD. Vous pouvez contacter notre partenaire. Master Lab, donc, pour, euh, pour euh, vous orienter, soit ils peuvent vous répondre ou nous pouvons le faire nous-mêmes. Donc, euh, merci pour votre attention. Merci beaucoup, docteur Alanda, pour euh, votre disponibilité, pour avoir euh, si gentiment accepté de, de faire cette présentation dans les délais. Donc, merci euh, à, à notre partenaire, la société Master Lab, d'avoir euh, bien voulu animer ce symposium. Je remplace professeur Mahmoud, qui n'est pas là, euh, qui s'est excusé de ne pouvoir modérer cette session. Donc, nous avons euh, 10 minutes d'échange avec la salle. Si vous voulez poser des questions euh, à monsieur Sacha ou à madame euh, Randa, la parole est à la salle. S'il vous plaît, un micro devant. Il est juste là. Thank you for your excellent presentation about our BD products. Uh, I have just one question about um, the high speed centrifugation of some of tubes. Uh, according to your data, uh, Uh, we can uh, make now uh, uh, very, very rapid centrifugation, uh, but we, you don't talk about hemolysis induced by those, uh, by those uh, new, new condition of uh, speed. Can you tell us a little more about, that, about it? Uh -huh. Can you hear me? Yeah, thank you so much for your question. Actually, general recommendation for centrifugation for most of the tubes, like for coagulation, uh, I would say 
it's like uh, from 10 to 15 minutes. For most of gel tubes, plasma gel tubes, for serum gel tubes, uh, general recommendations for most of the manufacturers, like approximately 1,200 up to 2,000, uh, 2000 G4s for 10 minutes also. So we can say that this is general recommendations for most of the, most of the tubes. If we talk about new technology, which I presented today, we, we call this technology Bericor, which is a uh, heparin technology, heparin tubes with mechanical separator. So there are different modes of navigation. It might be centrifuge within three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes. So it depends on the speed, depends on uh, how strong can centrifuge in your medical laboratory. So, for instance, if centrifuge and your medical lab supports high speed, which would be like 4,000 G4s, so in this case, the tube might be centrifuge within three minutes only. And uh, there are lots of studies done before showing that uh, such a high speed doesn't cause hemolysis. So it's the same level of hemolysis which you have with your current serum gel tubes, which might be centrifuge within 10 minutes. So it's like new technology which keeps better quality of specimen and improves your own time. Thank you so much. Sure. I, I would like to, I, I have a question also of you. Thank you for your presentation. My question is, is there any place for double centrifugation, um, and especially for um, some um, serology parameters? Is there any place for that? Yeah, thank you so much for your question. Actually, I would say that general recommendations, not uh, it just, not just comes from BD, from any other manufacturer. Uh, it's not recommended to centrifuge tubes uh, specimen twice, especially when we deal with gel tubes and even very core tube with mechanical separator. Because a uh, second round of centrifugation would affect gel performance, separator performance. So unfortunately, it would cause uh, most of gel globules, most, many of gel globules, which might appear in, in supernatant following, following the centrifugation process. And it also would uh, cause um, gel breakage and gel leakage uh, after centrifuge uh, tube second time. That's what I know. Uh, I have lab experience too, lab background, so I would say that sometimes we have to re-centrifuge tube uh, the specimen because of lipemia or any other uh, special requirements. That's why if such kind of process required, uh, I would recommend to so aliquote a sample into secondary tube and to so in future second time. In this case, we would avoid uh, any complications related to gel performance. Generally, we do that for some special cases, even when we have some limit values for some tests, such as, uh, for example, uh, HCV serology, when you have a very limit values, and when you centrifuge a second time, generally, you solve your problem. So in yeah. practice, we still do that, but I'm not sure it's uh, something uh, just, but I think that your reflection is, um, is interesting to early code before to centrifuge in another time. I would say that technically, uh, nothing serious might happen with non-gel tubes, like serum non-gel tube, plasma non-gel tube. Nothing serious would, ha would happen. It would slightly increase potential risk of hemolysis. But if we are dealing with gel tubes, I would highly recommend uh, aliquotin using secondary tubes and uh, second round of segregation. It will be best. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Y a-t-il une autre question? S'il n'y en a pas, oui. Donc, euh, micro, s'il vous plaît. Merci. Uh, thank you for uh, your, your excellent uh, presentation. I would like to uh, ask you uh, about uh, the added value in uh, pediatric uh, uh, samples used in a pediatric use for uh, for uh, preliminary pre samples. Uh, you mean um, what kind of solution for pediatric collection, pediatric uh, pediatrics? You mean uh, Baricor? Yes, Baricor. I did the value. What about the uh, value in practice use? Because we have uh, a lot of uh, problems in uh, our practice in hospital yeah. with uh, pediatric uh, samples. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's it's very interesting question. Uh, I always keep saying that it's uh, very difficult to get 
good quality, appropriate quality of specimen from cats, uh, especially when we are dealing with newborns and little cats. It's always like uh, difficult to get uh, enough uh, volume of blood uh, from such kind of patients and uh, to get good quality of specimen for um, different kind of lab tests. So if we are talking about this technology, like plasma, uh, plasma heparin technology with mechanical separator, so there are different uh, advantages which I would mention. First of all, uh, advantages of use of heparin plasma in general. This is beneficial first because if we um, compare uh, how, what's the volume of supernatant we can get from same volume of blood if we're dealing with serum and plasma. So with plasma we can get at least 10% more supernatant than we get from, uh, from serum. So this is first. If we move from serum to plasma, we get more supernatant to process more lab tests in same, from the same volume of blood. This is first. Second, we should not forget about tube consolidation because uh, when we collect blood for a different category of tests, like coagulation, chemistry, uh, hematology, uh, glucose, blood culture. So from one blood collection, sometimes we have to collect more than like 30 ml of blood, which is a lot. Uh, and we deal with newborns, it's almost not possible. That's why if we uh, think about tube consolidation approach, that this one tube with mechanical separator would consolidate many, many uh, we can say almost all yeah. non-whole blood-based yes. category of yes. tests into one tube. We collect one tube instead of four. Yes. Definitely we'll be able to get enough amount of blood plasma to, uh, to, uh, to run all those categories of tests into one tube. So this is another beneficial thing about uh, heparin uh, technology with mechanical separator. Yes. And last but not least, we should not forget about your own time. Because if we save time uh, from blood clotting time, from segregation time, if we uh, save time from reducing the number of uh, recollection rejections, yeah. definitely we provide clinicians with uh, much faster lab test results. And definitely patient satisfaction. We should not forget about patient satisfaction. It improves patient satisfaction if we collect less blood from uh, especially from little kids. And you have a, a speci specific uh, tube uh, for uh, blood uh, collection in uh, newborn? Uh, I would say that yes. minimum amount of blood uh, which might be collected in the barricade tube is 3 ml. Yes. 3 ml, yes. yeah. This is minimum. From 3, I believe, to 5.5 ml. Yes. So there are different field volume and different size of the tube, yes. different yes. dimension. Thank you. Thank you. Um, J'aurais une petite question à vous poser, Dr. Alanda, si vous permettez. Euh, donc on sait que les taux de positivité des hémocultures sont de l'ordre de 5 à 10% quand elles sont faites dans les meilleures conditions. Enfin, ma question, c'est avec vos dispositifs ou quand vous les implantez dans d'autres services, est-ce que vous sentez qu'il y a une amélioration ou est-ce qu'on est toujours sur des taux de positivité qui sont toujours de l'ordre du 5 à 10% quel que soit le, le matériel ou, euh, utilisé En fait, justement, le but de notre communication, c'est que euh, en utilisant les systèmes fermés qui sont préconisés par euh, beaucoup de, de praticiens, c'est que en utilisant ce système-là, ça va nous faire, euh, ça va nous réduire le, les manipulations. Du coup, en prélevant une seule, d'une seule manière, plusieurs flacons dans un système fermé, ça permet de diminuer la euh, contamination. Comment Déjà, en faisant les, les, les mots cultures, les, 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 les infirmiers en général font l'erreur de quand on prélève, il désinfecte mal le, le bras du patient. Ça, c'est le premier. Des fois, même si on désinfecte, on touche, on palpe à chaque fois la position, le site de prélèvement après désinfection. Ça, ça augmente aussi le taux de, de contamination. Donc, en, en prenant euh, en considération déjà la désinfection du site, de, 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 de prélever une seule fois plusieurs flacons, et non pas à plusieurs reprises, les gens ont tendance à utiliser des seringues pour prélever plusieurs tubes ou plusieurs flacons. Parce qu'en fait, une épicrânienne qui peut ne pas être pratique pour certains patients parce que ça fait mal aux patients. Mais avec notre dispositif système fermé, ça fait moins mal déjà 
et ça permet d'avoir un volume qu'on veut, du temps qu'on veut, avec un seul système. On n'a pas à piquer plusieurs fois. Donc là, ça diminue le risque de contamination. Merci beaucoup. Euh, S'il y a, a d'autres questions dans la salle, on peut en prendre une dernière. Bien. Euh, ben, S'il n'y en a pas, je ne peux que remercier nos orateurs, remercier le partenaire Master Lab. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much for your presentation. Merci à vous, madame, d'avoir fait cette présentation. Et puis, merci à tous ceux qui ont bien voulu y assister. Donc, je vous invite à la pause café euh, tout de suite et on reprend à 18h pour la conférence inaugurale euh, avec le professeur Jafar Haikel. Merci beaucoup. Thank you.